think we can start the recording then. Okay, so some general announcements here, some things that uh, this community should know about. Uh, during the summer, the updated versions of the minimal interoperability, interoperability mechanisms have been published. Uh, these are um, these correspond to the new structure that MIM has to have, which is called YMIM. There are several um, presentations that we make about what the MIMs are, these minimal interoperability mechanisms, and also the structure they have to have currently. Uh, so feel free to check it out. The updated version is available on the Living in You website, and you can um, you can go there to to read up about this. Uh, the reason this is important in this context because it uh, very much uh, res responds to or caters to the needs of a data space in the smart city uh, domain. Um, regarding this specific uh, webinar series, we already have uh, have had one webinar uh, in early June, which was dedicated to uh, the governance of data spaces. There, we had uh, several data spaces represented to see how the work regarding governance is going and what, what is it really in different domains and so that we can uh, compare it. This was also recorded, so if you're interested, my colleagues, uh, if they haven't done it already, they will post this information in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions regarding anything, always feel free to email me. So, as I said, we are currently in the preparatory phase of the, the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities, uh, which means that our work during this past year was concentrated on creating a blueprint that has both non-technical and technical uh, components to define an infrastructure that will help the efficient data sharing across the data space participants. Um, this preparatory action, action, however, is coming to an end. We only had one year, and uh, fingers crossed that it is coming to an end this month, um, because we have to also start the deployment. So it means that we are actually moving on to realizing what we've been working on for the past year. Uh, the deployment phase is then expected to start in October. Uh, when we say that this deployment phase is dedicated to the realization of uh, of this blueprint that's been, that we've been working on. It means that this deployment phase will call on cities and communities to uh, form mini consortia uh, and apply to become a site of piloting. Nine to 12 sites of piloting will be selected, so mini consortia. Um, that where we will work together with, uh, where the deployment uh, consortium will work together with uh, with uh, the mini consortia to, to actually realize the data space. If everything goes as expected, these calls should be out in January and everyone will have a couple of months time dedicated to uh, apply. In case of questions, of course, feel free to reach out to us. Um, a little bit about how to position the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities in the actual ecosystem and ongoing project of, uh, of the European digital scene. So firstly, uh, as I mentioned, there are um, different domain specific data spaces that are all supported by the data spaces support center. Uh, if you are in any way familiar with uh, the digital strategy of Europe, uh, they, these have been described that there is a need to establish data spaces uh, for each domain uh, so that they can be actually adopted to specific use cases. Uh, and as such, we also, as a, as a data space initiative, we belong to this network. And we also work closely together, uh, mainly with the data space support center, but we also uh, link uh, to all the other data spaces. Then the DS for SSCC is also a CSA uh, of the Living in EU movement. So it means that uh, much of the work that we do in the DS for SSCC 
benefits uh, or we bring it, to, bring it to the Living in EU movement. And one of those being that we are actually, uh, say we took the MIMS, the Minimal Interoperability Mechanisms that I mentioned earlier, to see how we can actually employ it in this context. And finally, uh, this year, January, the Sitcom AI testing and experimentation facility was launched together with other domain-specific testing and experimentation facilities. And this testing and experimentation facility is has the task to create an environment where AI-driven innovations can be tested. Uh, so that it can be, we can make sure that they correspond to the European vision and values and regulations, and it's safe for society. This project will also build on our data space blueprint. That said, we will arrive now to the actual purpose of this meeting, which will be that we will discuss the technical common grounds of data spaces. First, we will have Clara Pazuela from the Fireware Foundation, uh, who will represent today the Data Space Support Center. She will tell us about what the Data Space Support Center understands as the technical blueprint of a data space. And then uh, Tim Otuya, who uh, is a technical advisor at OpenNGI Smart Cities, so ask, will come in from the ds 4 SSUC side and explain how what are technical technical common grounds of data space in this specific domain. This will also allow us to reflect a little bit on how we can actually customize uh, the 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 blueprint, the technical blueprint of the DSSC to the specific domains. Please bear in mind that you are very welcome to post your questions in the chat uh, or any other thoughts or comments and we will have a dedicated uh, Q&A session. So Clara, I think it's time for you to come and take okay. the stage. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sophie, for the introduction. So I hope you can uh, see my screen and, um, can you see my screen or perhaps? Um... Yes, we can. Yes. Can. Now, now we cannot see your screen. Now it's stopped. The, the screen. I think now better. It's loading. It's there, but it's not in slideshow yet. Now we can see the DSSC asset. Okay. Okay. Good. So, uh, yes. Uh, no, sorry. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, inviting the uh, support center uh, to this uh, co-branded webinar with the data space for smart cities and communities. Uh, today I'm here uh, representing, as uh, Sophie said, uh, the, uh, the support center. And um, uh, the focus of uh, the uh, presentation today is to explain uh, which technical elements, which uh, technical items uh, can facilitate the support center to the data spaces, uh, in this case, uh, for smart cities and uh, communities. So um, before going into the details, uh, just to give an overview of uh, the different assets that uh, the support center uh, is uh, planning, is uh, currently delivering uh, to the different data spaces. So uh, we have uh, assets uh, from different nature, um, but today I will concentrate only on the ones that are in relation to the technical, to the technical grounds. So uh, the main mission of the support center is to uh, support and uh, to provide uh, the uh, needed tools and mechanisms uh, to, the data, to the data spaces for starting, uh, for, de for deploying and uh, for scaling uh, in the following uh, months uh, and years. So if we uh, have a look at uh, the asset model uh, of this approach, uh, you can see here how the different assets that will be delivered by the support center is uh, relating each other. And uh, today I'm going to concentrate on the, the ones that are in relation to the blueprint, uh, because uh, it's uh, the, um, the assets that uh, will be delivered uh, in order to provide uh, guidelines and mechanisms to the data spaces for uh, building their own uh, their, their own technical blueprints uh, in the data spaces. 
So in this way, we are uh, we have the mission, or uh, we have uh, put the blueprint at the core of uh, of the of the support center, as it's uh, one of the main uh, assets to be delivered to the data spaces, and uh, we will provide additional support to the data, to the data spaces for using and uh, deploying uh, this uh, blueprint. This blueprint has been created uh, in cooperation with these data spaces. So I mean. We have been exchanging with them uh, through different mechanisms that we'll be um, explaining during the presentation. Um, uh, the elaboration of this uh, blueprint and the different elements that are within the within the blueprint. So uh, let's go then into the details about uh, about this blueprint, what is inside, and uh, how uh, these elements can be used in your own data space. So uh, in terms of uh, composition, uh, the blueprint is um, composed mainly uh, but by, by what we call building blocks. The building blocks are those uh, uh, functional elements that are uh, essential to set up a data space and uh, they can be of different nature. So they, they can be technical, but they can be also uh, for business purposes, for legal purposes. So we will see later on uh, the proposed taxonomy of building blocks that, that the support center uh, is um, uh, providing. But uh, just uh, bear in mind that uh, the main elements of this, build, of this blueprint are these uh, building blocks. These building blocks are uh, described somehow from a functional point of view. And in the case of technical building blocks, uh, the, the, the support center is also providing uh, technical specifications. Um, these uh, technical specifications uh, will be for sure rely on the, some standards, some specifications, and some existing reference implementations that are already there. And uh, we'll be able also to identify uh, potential gaps uh, or missing elements that could be uh, relevant for creating future standardization requests or future uh, implementations. Apart from these uh, building blocks that are these functional elements, uh, these building blocks need to be explained how to, how to interact, how uh, to relate each other, and how to work together. And this, then the, the, um, there will be also some documentation uh, about uh, the integration of all these elements and uh, how uh, they work um, uh, together. And uh, two very important elements, uh, in addition to all these uh, building blocks, is on one side uh, the glossary, which is a kind of common vocabulary uh, for providing for producing uh, the documentation uh, in the uh, support center, and then the conceptual model, which is uh, a, a model that uh, uh, put in place all the concepts around the data space and also the relationships about, uh, amongst the, the different elements of a data space. The blueprint uh, will be continuously evolving. Uh, the first version is expected by the end of September, the 0.5, and uh, the full final version, uh, complete version, uh, will be uh, at the end of um, uh, March in April next year, more or less. So um, the green elements uh, will be all of them included in, the, in this first version by the end of September and some complementary uh, versions of the standards, implementations, and uh, documentation will be provided uh, as well uh, in April next year. So uh, which has been the approach? So we, orgi we or originally uh, took uh, the uh, building block uh, model provided by the OpenDI project, which was also already included in the um, uh, starter kit the document, uh, which was at first document that we uh, produced by the uh, end of last year uh, from the project. And uh, on top of this, uh, we positioned uh, more clearly uh, the business, the governance, and the legal aspects that were not uh, too much developed in the OpenDI uh, proposal. Then we also collected input from the community, and then we updated uh, this collection of building blocks with, existing, uh, with inputs from existing projects and initiatives, like, for example, uh, the technical convergence document of the data space uh, business alliance that has been considered uh, as uh, a reference uh, in the um, elaboration of this uh, proposed uh, taxonomy. So after this discussion, after this collection of inputs, uh, we came up with this uh, proposal of taxonomy for building blocks. Uh, it's divided in two main uh, pillars, the governance and the technical building blocks. 
uh, in the governance, um, the, the governance pillar has been uh, the one much more developed with regards to the OpenDI uh, proposal. And it has been also split into uh, the three main uh, sub pillars, which could be uh, business related aspects, governance itself related aspects and uh, legal and legal frameworks. It's still under development, but uh, this uh, can give you an idea about more or less uh, what they are doing uh, in that uh, regard. But today uh, the focus uh, is on the technical aspects. So uh, here you can see also the pillar of the technical building plus, which is uh, pretty much similar to the one provided uh, by the OpenDI framework. But uh, we have slightly changed uh, some um, uh, classification and some namings in the um, in the building blocks. Uh, but in essence, uh, they are bringing more or less uh, the same functionality that uh, was described in the in the OpenDI. But we are now here elaborating more in detail what uh, which are the functional and the uh, technical specifications uh, for each of the building blocks. So apart from the building blocks, uh, the Data Space Support Center is also proposing uh, three essential services that uh, should accompany uh, this uh, collection of building blocks in the deployment of a data space. On one side, we have um, uh, this uh, registry uh, of uh, credentials and identifications that uh, would be required in order to uniquely identify uh, the participants in a data space. Um, uh, also a service uh, for federation, uh, which implies that uh, uh, we have uh, we we may have uh, federated uh, discovery of services, federated marketplaces, uh, and so on. And uh, finally, uh, we are also bringing the concept of data space connector, which is a kind of um, a suite of components that uh, would be needed uh, to be connected to a data space and that you can uh, easily deploy locally in order uh, to uh, deploy all the functionality that is required for you as a participant to um, connect to a data space. So these are additional services, are not building blocks, but are services that uh, can be offered uh, from a data space uh, uh, in order to uh, connect and to deploy to a data space. So how to use the blueprint? Uh, so um, the idea is that when possible, try to follow this uh, proposed structure of building blocks in your data space. So it's easier for you because you don't have to reinvent the wheel and uh, you can simply use what is already there. If, uh, if not, you can also do the mapping between your building blocks and the uh, ones that are proposed by the support center. And in this way to identify uh, which are the missing elements or the incomplete functionalities. Um, if uh, these uh, identify missing functionalities are specific for your domain, you can refer to the generic uh, support center building block and then extend this building block with this functionality for your domain. And if you think that this functionality is relevant for other domains, you can contact uh, the support center and to propose an additional uh, functionality and modification of, of a building block or even an addition of a new building block. It's important to keep updated about the future releases of the blueprint. As, uh, as I said, uh, it will be evolving, so it's uh, important to keep updated. And uh, when um, uh, available, uh, you can also propose implementations of uh, the uh, building blocks that are specified by the support center, as we will be keeping a kind of inventory of uh, reference implementations, so you can uh, be validated as a building block implementation and then you can be part of this uh, repository in the future. So this is a, an upcoming uh, possibility. So in the blueprint, I have mentioned that uh, there exists also um, a, a collection of standards that uh, will be there in order to uh, build the technical specifications. So uh, we have also created then uh, this, uh, and this asset, which is basically this collection of the facto and the jury standards and the uh, reference implementations that uh, are being used, uh, are being, um, used for uh, the technical uh, specifications of the building blocks as uh, candidates. Uh, in these versions, uh, they are uh, in, the, in the version that will be published in September, uh, you will see how uh, some of the technical specifications of the building blocks are uh, um, suggesting or are uh, including uh, some candidate standards or implementations to be used uh, as a reference uh, for this uh, building block. 
Uh, we have structured this collection according to the categories and to the building blocks that uh, we have mentioned in the taxonomy. And uh, we have uh, one online spreadsheet for internal uh, management of these uh, standards and also a dedicated space in the data space support platform for sharing with the community. Uh, this collection are used uh, from different uh, users. Uh, for example, for the data spaces initiatives can be used in order to consult uh, which are the cross domain standards that are most, most uh, adopted uh, by other data spaces. And uh, they can also endorse uh, some of these standards uh, that they plan to use or they are already using. Uh, in general, the European Commission can also use this for proposing, uh, for identifying gaps in the in the standards, uh, and then to propose new standardization requests. And the community in general for uh, consult which are the most commonly adopted standards uh, in regards to data spaces. So here, just an example of uh, how it, how looks like the collection, uh, the internal spreadsheet, and also the space in the, the support platform, which is uh, only available for now for registered users uh, in the platform. Uh, any of you can uh, get a, a access to this, uh, to this uh, uh, platform, uh, but it will be uh, openly public in the website uh, by the end of September together with the, with the blueprint. This exercise, again, uh, I would like to insist of, uh, has been uh, co-created with the data spaces and is open to any data space to contribute and to um, uh, provide inputs to this uh, collection. So we did also part uh, some analysis of this collection, which currently uh, includes uh, more than 120 standards already um, from different typology. Um, and uh, we uh, have realized that the most covered um, uh, standard, the, the most covered uh, Category uh, are is, uh, is in the data sovereignty and trust and the data interoperability. And uh, as I said, uh, we are collecting the standards from different nature, uh, from uh, bodies um, like uh, WCC, ETSI, or OASIS, uh, but also from consortiums like Athena X, also uh, specifications from the European Commission, and also industrial bodies like Gaia X or IBSA. So you can see in the collection uh, standards and specifications coming from different, uh, from different sources. So how to use uh, these standards, uh, this uh, collection of standards. So you can uh, check which are the proposed standards and you can identify which are, are useful for your domain. And uh, of course you can endorse if you like uh, some, of these, uh, some of these standards. Uh, but you can also propose additional standards to be used in the specifications of the different uh, data space components, uh, either for, ball, for all domains or specific, or specific for, your, uh, for your domain, because we are uh, keeping separated those standards that are applicable for any domain uh, from those ones that are specifically uh, for, uh, for a domain. And uh, of course, um, uh, you can be informed uh, later on about the uh, recommended standards in order to foster interoperability uh, by the, the by by the uh, future versions of the of the blueprint. So far, there is no any recommendation for the moment. It's just uh, a collection of uh, candidates uh, standards. So I would like also to point out about uh, the glossary. I mentioned before that we need to uh, set up a common uh, vocabulary uh, across the different data spaces or at least uh, for the support center, uh, for all the support center communications and publications, we need to decide a common vocabulary in order to avoid any misunderstanding and any misleading uh, communications. And uh, then we are creating this glossary in co-development also with, uh, the data, with the data spaces. So it, it's a collection of terms um, uh, ordered alphabetically or per category in which you can find the different terms we are using the, in the support center along with the criterion and a definition. Because we know that uh, the same term can have different meanings in the different contexts, and that's why we are not enforcing to anyone to change uh, their language or to use uh, um, our glossary, uh, but it's important uh, to, um, uh, to see the correspondence between the, the terminology in a context and the terminology uh, proposed in the DSC glossary. Uh, as much as possible, we are adopting uh, terminology from the European legislation and also from international standards. 
and we are now working on the version 2.0. Uh, the first one was uh, is already available in the website uh, since the uh, end of last year. Uh, but now uh, here you have the link to the working document, so you can uh, even uh, propose uh, um, terms or definitions and uh, make comments on the existing definitions as it is an open document uh, for everyone. Sorry, how to use then the glossary? So uh, when you um, uh, are thinking in uh, using a term, uh, we recommend to check the DSC glossary and try to use it in a meaningful way. Uh, if you are using your own terminology, try to find the correspondence uh, with the glossary, looking at the definition that we are that we are proposing. And if you disagree with some definition or would you like to propose any other input, uh, you have just uh, to go to the working document and uh, to propose a reply there. And uh, the last element that I would like to comment on is on the conceptual model, uh, which is uh, this uh, this model that I mentioned before that is uh, putting in relation the different concepts of a data space. And here I could like to make a distinction between the uh, other uh, models that uh, we are working on as well as the architectural model. So in the case of the conceptual model, what we are trying is to organize uh, the fundamental concepts and terms associated to a data space using uh, the vocabulary that we have defined in the glossary in order to ensure that we are communicating properly and uh, in a consistent way all the time. We are categorizing these terms uh, and uh, we are trying to reduce the ambiguity that uh, we may have in, the dis in, in, in discussing data spaces uh, with, uh, different, uh, with different participants and uh, different data spaces. On the other hand, um, well, uh, the uh, version of the conceptual model will be delivered with a blueprint now at the end of September. Uh, but uh, we are also working in parallel in the architectural model, uh, which will be delivered uh, later, uh, later ahead, not uh, in this uh, version of the blueprint, in which we are tackling uh, other structural and, or and organizational aspects of data spaces. Uh, this architectural model is a kind of high level representation of the components, uh, what we call building blocks uh, in, the, in the blueprint and how they interact and they uh, can work together in, in a deployment. Uh, it includes uh, conceptual design, principles, patterns, uh, typically uh, used in uh, software engineering um, development. And uh, this uh, architectural model allows uh, to the participants in the data space uh, to, grasp, uh, to grasp the overall structure and behavior of the data space. So in this way, they can make a more efficient uh, planning and, de and deployment of uh, the data space. So coming back to the conceptual model, uh, the idea of this approach is to uh, improve uh, or to gain clarity and consistency in the usage of different concepts in a data space. As it has been built in a modular way, uh, it can be scaled and uh, extend in the future in case that we identify new concepts. Um, uh, the idea is to, uh, to reach interoperability if, if all of uh, us, we are using the uh, same conceptual model. And uh, also it's a benefit for uh, our documentation and, a common, uh, and creating a common understanding uh, for everyone that is reading uh, the support center uh, doc documentation. So then the purpose of the conceptual model is to fall on one side uh, to provide a well-defined language with precise, with precise concepts and terms in order to express uh, what we want to express uh, in, an, uh, in an understandable way and uh, also to provide a high level view of what is what a data space is in order to well highlight which are the basic components and uh, uh, being able to uh, put together all the elements in a data space in a common in a common picture so we have structured the conceptual model in three different levels uh, in the level 0 we are defining the concepts and the relationship that are, that are needed in order to define the ecosystem of the data space so which are the basic interactions with our, which is the ecosystem around the data space and uh, the federation concept can be also incorporated here in this level. In the level one, we are defining the main concepts of the data spaces. Uh, this includes uh, concepts uh, like products, trans tra transactions, governance, and so on. And the level two is a more um, granular view on the level one with more detailed view on the concepts like data policies, the role model, and so on. So 
how can you use the conceptual model? Well, uh, you, you, uh, we recommend uh, that you ensure that your vocabulary and descriptions are coherent with this conceptual model, with this proposal. Uh, check if, the, if your building blocks, how they are described and how they are implemented are compatible with this, uh, with this um, model. And also that your blueprint is consistent across your uh, building blocks uh, according to this, uh, according to this uh, model. So it's basically um, kind of assessment that you are using uh, same concepts and uh, same relationships. So if you want to keep posted about uh, any evolution of these uh, technical assets that the, the support center is uh, bringing to you, uh, you can follow on one side uh, the news and the publications in the website of the uh, of the project, and uh, you can request for any kind of support, uh, technical or general support uh, through this link. And uh, I would also recommend you to, if you are interested in the technical aspects of the data space, to join the technology thematic group, which is uh, meeting more or less every month. And uh, they um, they have a dedicated space in a, in the support platform of the of the support center. So uh, you can uh, be in, be involved uh, following also this uh, this link I leave here, and uh, also uh, we have monthly uh, insights uh, series webinars. Uh, the next one will be on the fifth of October and uh, will be exactly focused on the blueprint as uh, it will be delivered by the end of the month. The first webinar after uh, this delivery will be fully dedicated to the blueprint and um, how to use it. So I think it's uh, all from my side. I hope that I keep uh, myself in time. I think not, but uh, I, if you have any question, I will be glad uh, to answer it. Thank you. Many thanks, Clara. And don't worry, uh, I think we are still on time. Um, Timo, I think uh, it's time for you to present the SSC side. Yes, for SSC side. Thank you. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, I, can you see my screen properly? Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, so yeah, there's 50 people here, and uh, we only have a very short time to talk. Uh, I have uh, no idea of the profiles that are here in, uh, in the group, so I hope this will not be too high level. Um, I've, uh, I've looked for you on LinkedIn, some of you, uh, to find out who's here. And I see mainly academia and people related to the data space movement. So if I'm being too high level, please uh, use the Q&A features in Zoom. Uh, since we have very little time uh, for the Q&A afterwards, uh, make sure that you ask the questions you want to ask. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name, is, uh, my name is Timo. I'm a computer scientist in Belgium working for the digital agency of the city of Ghent. I'm um, also a long-time proponent of open data at Open Knowledge Belgium. I've, uh, I'm a consultant on the ds 4 SSCC project and very, very heavily involved with uh, OASC and, uh, and their work also on uh, digital twinning. So um, um, I will try to thank you very much, Clara, for the, uh, for the very clear ex uh, explanation of the SSC. Uh, I will try to uh, take the concepts uh, you presented and zoom in a little bit on the uh, ideas for SSCC, so the data space for smart sustainable cities and communities specifically. So um, let me see if I can get to the next slides. Yeah, first of all, uh, might be interesting to, for those that don't know, uh, position this project again. Uh, Sophie did it uh, already at the start. Um, but to give an idea, this is a slide I, I like lots uh, to really position how ds 4 SSCC is aligned with all the other data spaces, is that you could say that each of the data space domains are verticals. Uh, so Europe is funding data spaces within each of these domains, health, manufacturing skills, I don't need to uh, explain to you. But as a civil servant, um, we get in touch with... Uh, all of these. So, I mean, if you're doing urban planning, if you're trying to uh, trying to change uh, the modal shift within your cities, if you try to increase tourism, uh, energy efficiency, you will at some point uh, be confronted with the uh, dependency on other data spaces. Uh, and uh, so typically uh, the data space for smart, sustainable cities and communities will be a, a large integration exercise over different domains and very importantly, will always have a geographical component. So because you're working uh, pretty much, well, well, almost always, working pretty much on the ground uh, on what uh, needs to be done in the city. Um, 
As opposed to that, you have Destination Earth, which is basically uh, using uh, re remote sensing uh, to battle climate change. Uh, you could say that is heaven, while uh, DS4 SSEC, colloquially speaking, is hell, you know, uh, really organizing the integration of all these different services within uh, city borders or communities. So uh, what I wanted to introduce uh, quickly, I don't know if uh, all of you are, sim are familiar with this, so I really just wanted to go through it uh, once again quickly. What are the minimal interoperability mechanisms that, uh, that Sophie already quickly presented at the start? Uh, I was so uh, I took uh, I took the liberty to steal some of your slides, Sophie. So uh, I just wanted to introduce that um, interoperability mechanisms are there because they are required because we do not live in a perfect world where we can easily exchange data within uh, implementations and different uh, providers and so forth. And this will also never be the case. We will never be able to standardize fully um every every different provider i mean there are commercial interests there are uh there are domain specific things that you cannot standardize uh so we live in a very messy reality um but that does not mean that we cannot integrate you know so that does uh, especially not mean that you should uh, invest large amounts of uh, rehauling your entire it infrastructure and able to be to be able to comply with uh, with a specific standard or to be able to connect with another vendor uh, no, there is always a very, in my opinion, quite high level of uh, of minimal interoperability that is possible with very uh, with very small changes or uh, by doing very small actions. Um, so the MIMS are uh, they have a value position towards uh, many stakeholders, but basically they are a common list of standards and technical specifications uh, within specific domains. Each MIM is one of these domains and they provide uh, key enablers, uh, let's say mechanisms uh, on how to move between these uh, technical specifications. Um, there will there will also be working on this, there will be a common marketplace for integration tools, um, let's say mappers, transformers, this kind of stuff uh, in order to move from one spec specification to another. The MIMS are being developed within the living in EU context. For the MIM Plus, uh, at least, are there? Uh, there has no, there is no commercial interest behind them. Um, they are really just there to increase the efficiency for cities and communities to enable innovation consortia, businesses, and policymakers to work more efficiently. So, this is an overview of all of the MIMS currently being managed. Um, you'll see that they are uh, subdivided into different categories. There is the interaction category, which is basically about data models and uh, exchanges. Uh, integrity is everything that you need really to build uh, trusted relationships uh, within a data space. And impact is how these MIMS can be um, useful for actually uh, changing things on the ground. Um, we have to be fair uh, and state that uh, MIMS 1 through 4, um, actually MIMS 5 should be in dark blue here as well, are uh, are being developed or are very well developed and the others still need uh, quite a lot of work. But anyone is welcome to join the working groups and uh, and develop these MIMS further. So, uh, Sophie already mentioned quickly, uh, how are they governed? MIMS Plus, these are the European variants. Uh, they are managed by Living in EU. Uh, the technical subgroup of uh, living in you there are the uh there are the global mims which are being managed by the city of the, uh, the council of cities of oasc and there is an international standard um being put forward uh, to the itu uh, not to standardize each individual mim but to standardize the format of a mim so that we all agree uh what it really is a, mentor, a minimal interoperability mechanism um, so the core principles of a MIM are that we want a basic set of requirements that are easy to implement, so no complicated uh, translation rules, mapping, and so forth, just, just the things that you need to enable as good as possible interoperability. And this can be very small things, a stupid example, changing the column headers of an Excel in some cases can provide minimal interoperability. So don't uh, see this as a very heavy set of requirements, they're very lightweight and very principled. Uh, why MIM, the standard as mentioned, being put forward by the ITU is just a way to describe a MIM so that we each uh, that we each understand the same thing. Um, basically, they start with an objective. Uh, for MIM 1, this is context, ma context management. The objective would be uh, to be able to exchange con context information between different brokers or data spaces. 
And then we will drill down to what does this really mean in terms of the capabilities for systems, the requirements of these systems, which specifications really adhere to these requirements, and then which mechanisms can we use to implement them. And there, and there will be in the future, right now it's not the case, there will be conformance and compliance testing for each and all of the MIMS. Um, just looking at the time here. Yeah, we'll hurry up. Uh, this is a simple example of uh, how MIM 1 is structured in, uh, according to the YMIM format. So the capabilities are listed here. They are, there are only three. They are very high level. Uh, and these imply a little bit more detailed requirements, but still uh, people uh, that are uh, familiar with standardization uh, will directly see that these are very high level requirements. They're not very detailed at all. Uh, then for each of these requirements, we can define a mechanism on how to implement them. Uh, for instance, this is the example of NGSILD. NGSILD is a standard uh, developed and, uh, and managed by, by Fireware. Uh, and how this standard, together with its implementation in a context broker, really adheres to all of these requirements. I'm not going to go through them one by one, it's just to try to uh, make it a little bit more clear how uh, these MIMS are actually structured. Okay, then um, I want to uh, zoom in on the building blocks. Uh, Clara already mentioned um, DSSC uh, identified a lot of building blocks. Uh, the DS4 SSCC project, yeah, sorry about all the abbreviations, but this is the, so DS4 SSCC has um, worked on these building blocks and produced some uh, more or some raffination. So I really don't need to, to uh, reiterate on this. We're now on technical common ground, so we were, we we're only looking at the technology-based technology building blocks, uh, uh, which are uh, subdivided in these nine categories. Um, we have compiled also on our website the inventory for DS4 SSCC of all the specifications that uh, and the building blocks that can be relevant for uh, sustainable communities and uh, citizen communities. So uh, if you're working within a city or a community, please have a look at this. Uh, this is based both on, of course, the information that was uh, developed by the DSSC, but also an extra in-depth analysis of over 100 smart city projects. We had a survey for policymakers and uh, local authorities and uh, a whole bunch of uh, in-depth interviews, of which Clara, uh, or, uh, and <laughs> not in the least, did quite a few. Um, and we came to uh, building blocks, and these uh, building blocks can be categorized within uh, these three categories. They are either standards, they are specifications, or they are reference implementations. Just to make clear that not everything is just a building block. I mean, uh, a standard is only a standard when it is recognized by one of the recognized standardization uh, organizations, just like ISO, ITU, uh, W3C, and so forth. A specification is an industry standard. It's something that a vendor or a group of vendors defines on their own. It's not necessarily governed by uh, by a standardization body. Um, and reference implementations just there, I mean, uh, we really need to make uh, a differentiation between a data format, a standard, a specification, and a piece of software. So all of these uh, are, are uh, integrated within the inventory, but the, we really make the differentiation between them. Um, so uh, some just uh, to drill down a little bit to the real technology level, because I think there are quite some technologists right here. Uh, within uh, smart uh, cities and communities, we identified some commonly used technologies. Uh, so this is uh, uh, some of the work we did uh, within the project. Uh, I will go through a few, a few of them. There's not and the, not at all to endorse them. It's just uh, you know to sketch the lay of the land uh, and to. Uh, to get the more concrete insight of how cities are organized right now and what it means for the structure of the data space. Um, first big category, uh, we identified three categories that are really important. Uh, geographic tools, like I said at the start, uh, cities and communities are mainly managing land, right? So obviously the people, but the people are living on land. So oh, geogra geography, GIS is still uh, a core uh, activity of any city or community's management. Um, these are the tools that are commonly used. Uh, I think ESRI is mostly used within cities, uh, but there are open source alternatives like QGIS. Um, some smaller communities might even use web-based uh, GIS, like Home Apps. 
Uh, and often uh, cities are also uh, relying on remote sensing. So uh, LIDAR, satellite data, aerial photography, these kind of things to uh, get, an, get an insight into the actual state of uh, their geographic territory. Then GP GPS and GNSS are positioning systems. Um, I have something to say about this on the next slide. Uh, obviously, we as developers are, uh, are mostly relying on GPS. This is an American standard. There is a better European alternative uh, within the Galileo Copernicus projects, which is much more, much more detailed um, for European users. So uh, please, uh, if you are a developer and you're using GPS, consider at least uh, using EGNSS. Um, then second, uh, um, the largest uh, vendor in Europe is uh, ESRI Arches, which is an American solution. It provides cloud-based cloud solutions as well. Be wary, uh, always check data ownership and GDPR constraints. Um, data ownership, meaning that be sure that you don't have a contract uh, in which you manage a lot of geographic data and then at the end are not able to export it or uh, God behold that it is being used uh, to or sold to other companies. Um, make sure that when you're using a GIS system, it is also capable of integrating with non-geographic data sources, because especially in terms of data spaces, we will be getting a lot of sensor data, which might be geocoded or not, uh, but also statistical data that you want to be able to maintain in some common uh, database or uh, data source, data lake. Uh, uh, make sure tooling supports open standards. In the GIS world, this is mostly, mostly the case. Uh, mostly open OGC standards are used. And uh, by all means, use as many features as you can within the contract that you have with your vendor, but be aware of lock-in before, we, for example, um, uh, Yesri also provides a one-stop shop uh, open data portal. If you want to set up an open data portal, obviously this is very easy, but in turn, you will find that you cannot uh, publish data sets that are not geographic or not uh, contained within uh, ArcGIS uh, itself. So uh, use the features, but be very scrupulous about which ones you want to use. Um, I hurry up a little bit. Um, what we also see is the evolution of local digital twins. Many cities are making them. I include two uh, often used standards for the presentation of digital twins. Such GML is uh, a 3D city model standard that is very widely used. Uh, it can uh, it also it also contains semantic data, so you can really say this feature is this type of thing. This is a tree. This is a car, uh, but it's not as performant as the next one. This is a GLTF is uh, uh, an open file format, which can be used to render digital twins, but it's much, much more optimized for 3D applications in VR. Uh, obviously, people that work in urban planning district, uh, departments will also know uh, the CAT tools, which are typical urban planning tools. Um, now, uh, why are these special for cities, uh, these tools? Because cities are uh, traditionally very large uh, in comparison to uh, other 3D modeling uh, tools, most uh, 3D modeling tools, uh, 3D Studio Max, you only uh, model one object. If you have to model and maintain an entire city, that's quite a different uh, difference in scale and a difference in, uh, in, in software you need to use. Um, also here, uh, if you're developing a digital twin, you have 3D models, make sure that the assets can be annotated so you can still find the type of assets that is uh, that is included or that you can basically spot on the on the map. Uh, again, such GML is very good at this, uh, GLTF is uh, slightly less good. Uh, make sure you can easily import from uh, 3D, 3D modeling tools and that uh, if you're using point data, so LiDAR data, if you do scanning of 3D objects, um, it can take uh, extensive computing power to uh, include this kind of data in 3D models. And so you need to uh, be aware of that. And then uh, last, but certainly not least, some industry standards for sensor data management. We're talking data spaces. We're talking real-time data here. Uh, I think within uh, the smart city contact, NGSILD is uh, widely adopted and very well known. It's a standard for uh, real-time data, which also allows you to semantically annotate uh, the, the kinds of measurements you're making. Uh, linked data event streams is an upcoming standard, which is uh, fully based on event streams. So it's basically just logging the changes within a data set and not the data set in a, in a whole. Uh, it is very useful because it's very concise and still has the full power of the semantic web behind it. So it's uh, fully linked data. And then MQTT or Mosquito is, uh, let's say, the industry standard for, uh, for uh, IoT uh, solutions. It's very lightweight. It's a classic publish-subscribe uh, messaging protocol that you will have to uh, 
uh, use uh, together with pieces of software that can can store this data a message queue to be uh, to be more precise. Uh, these are some of the tools that uh, that we are using, also related uh, to uh, the NG NGS ILD ecosystem is the Orion Context Broker. It's a context broker tool where you can uh, basically uh, list and discover new uh, sensors. Uh, Kafka is the industry standard for distributed events uh, streaming platforms. And Apache NiFi is a very, very useful tool that will allow you to integrate different data sources with different formats that are uh, coming and that are providing data in real time. All right, this is my last slide. I didn't see the clock, so I hope we still have some time. Well, I just wanted to step in and see, like, you know, I think we really <laughs> uh, But I did uh, post in the meantime in the chat that. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, to, to urge people to share their questions already. Uh, but no one has shared any questions so far. So maybe if you have any, it's time to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, so maybe there are no questions. Everyone was so clear or so confusing that uh, people are speechless. Ah, there is one. So Thomas uh, Royko in the chat asked a question, but you can unmute yourself, Thomas, if you want, or I can just read it. Uh, did you analyze how the interoperability of the presented standards can be realized, data brokers? Um, we didn't. We didn't uh, analyze it for each of the standards. No. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is ongoing work. Uh, if you're saying data broker, this is work that's being done within the uh, MIM1 working group. So because of the, the MIM1 is about context. I see Clara has something far more interesting to say probably. Oh, yes, just to mention that uh, now uh, here talking on behalf of uh, Fiverr, at least uh, in the interoperability between uh, NGS ILD and LDES that has been already mentioned. Um, we are um, well developing or uh, exploring uh, how to how to make them work together, and uh, we are developing some extensions uh, in order to to address LDs um, uh, together with uh, NGS ILD. So just uh, as a note, so so yes, the, the 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 answer is that in some cases, yes, we analyzed uh, uh, how some of these standards can work together uh, and in the concrete case of NGS, ILD, and LDES, uh, we are working on that. And then uh, Kazik Anhat asked uh, which uh, one sustainable citizen committees projects we are aiming at particularly. Um, I don't think there is a priority, um, but correct me if I'm wrong. All, all domains are, I mean, the, the whole idea is that they have to be cross-domain. So all use cases that are cross domain are relevant. Any, anyone has something to add here? Okay. Okay. I don't know. Uh, it, to me, it's difficult to give only one example uh, where the standards have been already applied. So of course, there are examples uh, where some of the standards in the, both in the, the support center collection and the uh, Data space for smart cities and communities collection has been already applied, but it's difficult to find. Uh, so perhaps uh, in in some of the use cases that we have uh, analyzed in the context of the data space for smart cities and communities uh, could be one one good example uh, for the application of the standards. But uh, there are plenty of them, so I don't know, Timo, if you could uh, highlight some of them or one of them. It's difficult to find. Well, we uh, for the uh, we are now answering the question of Kazik, right? Uh, in in DS for SSCC, we've researched about a hundred uh, smart city projects. Um, so we selected in the end, we only selected four or five, and we basically went in depth with those uh, because we uh, we wanted to have a, a, a great degree of diversity. Um, so yeah, there was a, a very detailed selection criteria and so forth. So uh, I can. Uh, I can provide you uh, with the, with the list and the selection criteria and the results. Uh, if you're interested, no problem. 
Yeah, I see also some question in relation to Gaia X. Uh, so I, I don't know if the question is for support center or for data space for smart cities and communities. Uh, but uh, yes, definitely, at least in the collection of the um, support center, uh, of the collection in the collection of the standards of the support center, I mentioned that one of the sources uh, to gather reference and uh, standards uh, is coming from Gaia X. And uh, in the collection, you can see uh, very favorable credentials or uh, the trust framework from Gaia X uh, already mentioned in the collection. So it's uh, taken into consideration, especially for what has to do with the, the trust uh, um, mechanisms for the data space. Okay. Um, any Thomas Reiko for comments? Have you guys uh, covered it in the meantime? Just quickly, uh, Thomas, we did research Helsinki. It's one of the use cases, well, the smart city projects that we that we researched in depth. Uh, Rotterdam, we uh, we did research, but not as in depth as, as Helsinki. And then we had uh, Valencia, uh, the region of Flanders, um, and um, uh, Slovenia. Then we have uh, maybe just we can take a couple of more minutes to answer two more questions. So we have George Sivirez asking about data models and vocabularies and the RDF of GAIA-X and the International Data Spaces Information Model, RDF, which are going to be the standard. <laughs> yeah, that's something I that's something I cannot answer. Um, uh, sorry, I cannot see this question. <laughs> it's in the Q and A as uh, part. No, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I was looking uh, at the at the chat. All um, slides will be shared. Just in the meantime, so. so could you could you repeat the question because I cannot see the Q and A uh, about data models and vocabularies and the RDF of Gaia X uh, and the International Data Spaces Information Model RDF, which are going to be the standard. Well, as I said before, uh, there has not been yet any kind of uh, specific recommendation on any specific standard or specification to follow. So the exercise that has been uh, done so far is uh, to identify what is already there. And um, uh, now in the definition of the different building blocks, uh, they are using these uh, candidates in order to define uh, the specifications of these uh, uh, of the different building blocks, but uh, there, there, there is no any specific recommendation about any specific standard so far uh, in, order, in order to follow. This is uh, a, a next step, and uh, it's not yet decided uh, to what extent uh, um, we need to be prescriptive uh, at the time to, to define a concrete, a concrete standard to be used or uh, just uh, simply to to propose which are uh, the possibilities out there. Okay, and then we had one more question about uh, the overlaps of information objects among different domains. How would it, how do we deal with those overlaps? This is, a, this is a follow up question of uh, some yes. of Antonella's early, earlier questions. Uh, very to the point, by the way. Uh, yes. Um, so these overlaps in, within smart data models, there is quite some work being done to identify and uh, fix these overlaps, but I would refer you to uh, Alberto Albello uh, from uh, from Fiverr. All right. Yes, of course. Any any question about the smart data models, uh, we can uh, forward it to Alberto and uh, he, can, he can solve the candy. Yeah. Um, Thomas uh, Roykov is addressing you, uh, Timo, to please uh, uh, send him um, some of the things you mentioned. I will, I will Thomas. Just, uh, just, send me, uh, just send me your question by mail and uh, I will reply. Perfect. Uh, well, apologies about the really short Q&A session that we had today, but uh, I believe you have the email address for everyone and we will share the slides that also list the email addresses of everyone. So should you have any questions? You can, uh, you can always contact us. Uh, and I would like to close now this meeting. I understand there is one more question about cross-domain. It means uh, just having, for example, uh, tourism, a tourism uh, a domain together with mobility, for example. So data from different domains combined. Um, 
So thank you very much uh, for attending and joining us today online. In case you have any questions, please email us. And uh, well, we will see you soon. Uh, and please don't forget that the preparatory action is coming to an end this month, which means that very soon you will be hearing from the DS4 SSC deployment action. Goodbye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.